Hello, attendees, and welcome. If you could please type in your name and where you're tuning in from in the comments box, much appreciated. Like this video so others in your network can also enjoy this content. Welcome to IFMA's latest FM Trends webinar. Today's webinar examines the highlights from the upcoming report, which will be located in the IFMA store. The report will be available for purchase in the coming weeks. The initial price, estimated price, for IFMA members is 195 US dollars. Non IFMA members, 245 US dollars. Participants in this study receive a free complimentary copy of the final report. Today's presenters are Jake Smithwick, University of North Carolina at Charlotte, Professor, Engineering and Construction, and Graduate Program Director. Juliana Sama, University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Juliana is pursuing a master's degree in construction and facilities management, and then her PhD. Over to you, Jake. All right, thank you so much, and thank you all for being here today. I know it's uh, kind of the end of the year, or beginning of the year, depending on where you're at uh, throughout the world, and we're super thankful to have everybody here today. Um, we have a huge audience today. Uh, I think we're north of 700 people, so this is fantastic, and certainly this topic is of interest to a lot of folks here today. So let me kind of walk through the, the agenda here today, what we're going to be talking about. Um, the, the essence of this report is focused on how do we identify what's coming down the line in the future in terms of global facility trends. And I will tell you that <laughs> as we're wrapping up this particular study and what we've done with this, it's a, uh, it's a bit of a monumental task in terms of understanding what that future looks like and what we need you to, to prepare today as a facility professional. So we'll walk through kind of how we put the other report, uh, some of the major technology trends we're seeing, uh, hybrid work models, healthcare facility management, which I know is pretty specific, but I'll explain why we're talking about that. And then we'll have a summary of the key takeaways at the end of our discussion here today. Uh, be sure to uh, ask questions in the chat box, whether you're on LinkedIn or directly on the website. Uh, we will be certainly having time at the end of the discussion here today to ask for that. I'll also post a link at the end if you want. If you want to copy the slides, you can send us an email and we'll be glad to share that with you. So a little bit about our group. Uh, the, I, obviously, uh, Juliana and I are with the University of North Carolina in Charlotte here in the United States. We also, together with our team uh, called Simplar, we work on a variety of different projects and efforts related to facility management, procurement, project delivery. And the goal here is to help people get better at whatever it is that their 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 mission is. So we're, we're happy to partner with DIFMA on this particular project and, and numerous other projects as, as well. So the first thing I wanna start off with here is a brief history lesson as to how we got to today. Uh, we first started working with DIFMA, um, it was in 2017, and we published uh, together with DIFMA is the Operational Maintenance Benchmark Report, which had been published for, I, I don't know, 20 or 20, 30 year, 20 or 30 years uh, prior to this point in time. And from there, uh, what we began realizing is that there's actually quite a bit of data and information that uh, facility professionals have access to. So we published the qualitative report, uh, 2020, the space planning report. Now, this one was interesting, is that from a research standpoint, you always look to understand what's currently going on in the world. This particular report, the space planning report in 2020, we finished collecting data, uh, not exaggerating folks, three weeks before the whole world shut down because of COVID. And so if you're looking for a really good benchmark in terms of like space allocations or space utilization, that particular report, I have not seen anything else out like that, that provides a really good view of what things used to look like. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, we're currently updating that report. Uh, we're actually working on that now. And uh, next year we'll have a full update in terms of new space benchmarks and perspectives. So be sure to keep an eye out uh, from them. In 2021, we published the Global Salary Report, which provide insights about pay strategies, workforce conditions, and that's certainly been insightful. So be sure to look at that. And then in 2022 and 2023, we have expanded uh, globally in terms of benchmarks across uh, major different areas. Uh, so in fact, we, we just finished up Africa, um, Asia, the Middle East, and other regions are also on the docket to provide benchmark and data from a global standpoint. The reason why we talked about this history of practical reports and what's been done here is that informs us or gives us insights as to what the major uh, focus of this report is going to be uh, in the future. 
So in terms of major trends as to what the support is going to look like, there's really a couple of major areas that we wanted to focus on here. Uh, technology, what major technology trends are coming down here. Hybrid work models, which has already kind of been in place. What I mean by hybrid is both physically in office, remote working, and somewhere in between. And so we'll talk about that. Sustainability has certainly a, a been a, a topic of interest for a lot of folks. And facilities healthcare, that's, I know that's a very specific field and interest area, but if you look at the, the broader demographic trends and what's happening, um, the need to provide healthcare facilities for many, many parts of the population is certainly going to be an increasing need uh, over time. So, then, and we'll explain why we talked about that uh, in, in detail here, right? Now, before we dive into the details of this, um, you know, technology trends in FM, that's, again, if, if somebody asks you, like, what are the major trends going to happen in the next 10 years in FM uh, from a technology standpoint? I mean, there are certainly trends, but that's a very broad question, right? So when we focus on there, there's really, you know, six major areas that we kind of group that down to um, that we'll talk about is building technologies for the actual physical uh, environment. Uh, smart technologies and IoT, uh, artificial intelligence, which is all the rage these days, as, as we all know. In fact, maybe some of you are robots here or AI, but we'll, uh, we'll certainly talk about that today here. And uh, we'll into cybersecurity, building information modeling, and some other developments related to BIM and CMMS that might be uh, beneficial. Now, as part of the study, we, we conducted interviews with a, a number of uh, world-renowned experts in this field. Uh, we're certainly thankful for Dean Stanberry and uh, Stacy uh, Shepard uh, that provide insights and then perspectives on the report. And we'll highlight some of their comments and perspectives as we go through and talk about this. So with that said here, we'll, we'll keep moving forward. And at this point in time, I'd like to uh, have uh, Juliana uh, Samoa from our team to come in and talk about some of the major technology trends we're seeing uh, with building technologies. So Juliana, go ahead and take over. Okay. so. Exciting times ahead. <laughs> right. So building technologies are technologies that make buildings efficient. And as facility managers, we would want to benefit a great deal by using the appropriate technologies to manage our own facilities. But there's a lab in Detroit that's headquartered in Detroit called the Code Lab that have used some technologies like video surveillances and occupancy detectors and have realized that they saved about $325,000 in using these technologies. So the team saw this urgent need to take a look at the various trends of technologies that can assist us, you and I as facility managers in the industry to you know, look at these technologies and how and how they can benefit us. We evaluated technologies like AI, cybersecurity, CMMS, and BIM. Now let's take a roller coaster ride on these technologies. I'm sure you are excited. <laughs> so smart building technologies. What are smart buildings? Smart buildings are automated buildings that are made to be intelligent with some level of human intervention. So smart buildings, they can help you optimize some four basic elements of your facility when used. The structure, the systems, services, and the management of all the elements of your buildings. You might be wondering how I can make my building smart or how you can make your existing structure smart. We would look at how these um, smart building technologies, if implemented in our buildings, would help the facility manager. So the facility manager can implement smart sensors on your HVAC system to make it intelligent. How does this work? Once you implement those sensors on your HVAC system, it can monitor and automatically adjust air filtrations. So the FM can monitor these air filtration on your HVAC off-site. You don't necessarily have to be on site to do these um, adjustments. So another essential element that the smart buildings use are IOTs. What are IOTs or Internet of Things? They are enabled in facility management equipment to collect data, exchange data, and connect data. This data that it collects can help to detect leaks that happen on equipment, can help to detect deterioration that happen on equipment, and track energy use. So it's quite interesting. Finally, some luminal lighting controls 
are also smart devices that helps you dim lights when you have a considerable amount of lights coming from windows in your buildings. It's smart. So once it notices that the amount of light you need for your building is coming naturally into the, the room, it would dim the existing lights in your facility to ensure that there's a balance. However, if your facility is closed and an intruder walks into the facility, these luminaire lighting controls can help to detect a person and alert the FM whether he is at work or not. So you'll be wondering how these smart building technologies benefit an FM. Yes, they help to risk mitigate, like you can better mitigate your risk, but how do you do that with your smart building technologies? You can enhance safety and security by monitoring building systems, identifying potential risks earlier, allowing you as an FM to have prompt response as they come in. Also, the devices that are enabled with IoT, like I said initially, they provide data. So you can use this data analytics to predict if you have any equipment failures before they occur. And so do when you reduce downtime and maintenance costs that can have on your equipment. It also automates the, the building in such a way that it makes it optimal and comfortable. And the building becomes very efficient. Once your building is optimal and very comfortable, you as the worker or employee is productive in whatever you do. It also makes the employee very productive in everything that they do. It reduces energy waste, which is a very key component of the industry now, sustainability. Once you have all these smart building technologies being implemented, your energy consumption and cost is reduced to the bare minimum. We we'll also dive into a very hot topic for AI, Dr. Smithwick. Yeah, absolutely. So artificial intelligence, um, <laughs> as we all know here today, is uh, kind of all the rage uh, with regards to what's going on with that. And you know, we had already thought about uh, kind of address these AI topics in this report as we've been working on this, you know, for the past uh, few months about this. But uh, AI, just in the last, if you think about you know, the last 12 months, uh, when, for example, ChatGPT was released, uh, that particular version of AI um, has just completely exploded across the globe in terms of accessibility to these technologies. Now, on the previous slide, when we talk about smart buildings, and what that means, you know, for example, automated, you know, lighting systems and other more efficient ways to run our buildings. What we're not saying here that if we're talking about global future trends, and I know that many organizations have that, the essence here or why we talked about that is to think about the data access that we have as facility professionals and to understand that, you know, where the risk is a lot of the time is that when we as a, as a human or as a facility professional have to make a decision about something that maybe is based on inaccurate or uh, not full picture information, that's where risk comes in here, right? So the less decision-making that we can do as a facility manager as trying to make, you know, the best operational decisions for our, our organization, that's where we get benefit out of. Now, artificial intelligence, uh, what this is, does is to simulate um, actual human intelligence to give a particular situation to know how to proceed in a uh, particular environment. Now, one thing I'd recommend you all write down, uh, take a note of this here, is artificial general intelligence or AGI. Uh, it's a theoretical future outcome that, that may one day achieve here. What AGI is, is basically the ability of a, of a system, a, a computer system, to act and think like um, and actually, it can reason and learn from what's actually happening. It currently does not exist as, as far as we know. But the future perspective on this is that it's very likely that something like that will happen, right? Now, with regards to facility operations, again, the main benefit uh, when we think about AI and its effect on facility managers is understanding the data we have coming in and to automatically know and predict what's going to happen very quickly and very efficiently. The other impact of AI that we're seeing here, and again, the, the story is definitely not told. told. In, in fact, I would submit that the, the story about AI is just now starting. The major things that I think there are certain sectors of the, of the world that are going to be significantly impacted as to what that, that's going to happen, right? 
So I think about some of the benefits of AI uh, in our facilities is uh, you know b- better decision making, which means cost savings, better security, uh, augmenting our workforce. That's one of the major outcomes that we saw here is that uh, we know that a lot of facility organizations and construction and other related fields don't have enough people. And we'll talk about that kind of towards the end of the presentation, but if we don't have enough people to have, you know, what we might say eyeballs on the ground to see what's going on here, we've we've talked with a number of organizations are starting to look at AI as a way to supplement um, the workforce from a sensor, you know, data standpoint, collection standpoint, as, as to what's going on here. So one of the questions that just came in uh, from uh, Mr. Jonathan here is, has it started yet? And I wanna to get to this in a minute in terms of AI. And the answer is, uh, if we mean started as in things are different, uh, then my opinion, the answer is, is yesterday, right? It, it certainly has started, things are coming down the line, but the impact is not nearly as widespread as what's likely going to happen in the future. And I appreciate you know, Dean's comment response to that. And machine learning you know, incorporated into many FM technologies today like fault detection, right? I mean, that's one of the major, I remember I saw a research study, it was probably 10 years ago. And what they had done is they installed these simple little sensors inside of a, a piece of mechanical equipment that detects vibrations. And they did all this research here. They found that when there's more vibrations on this motor, that was indicative about three months out that that piece of equipment was, was gonna fail. Now, the way they collected that information, they just went out there they downloaded the, the files on their USB stick, plugged in the computer and looked at it. It's a very labor intensive process here, but those are examples of very early uh, iterations of what this technology do. Like Dean said, that fault detection and knowing when something's going to break is, is really quite interesting, right? Now, when you think about the impact of AI and how disruptive it's gonna be, we, we see this quite often here. In fact, if you go through a brief history lesson, the last 300 years, that anytime there's been a major technology shift is that uh, a lot of people are concerned, well, we're gonna lose our jobs, everything's gonna you know, change or whatever. And what we've seen here is that that's not really happened, right? Anytime there's a new, there's an introduction of something new here from a technology standpoint, um, not people don't lose jobs. Now, what does happen here, well, let me make, clarify that a little bit. There are certainly people that lose their jobs, but what we see here is that most of the time they start reskilling and, and change the nature of what those jobs are, right? Somebody I talked to recently, or not talked to, but I read an interview recently, is a, a futurist, I, I forgot the guy's name, but his opinion is that when you think in the early 1900s, when electricity was introduced, I mean, that, that completely revolutionized how people just live like their personal lives, right? You no longer have to go to bed because the sun's down, right? You can have candles, but that can only do so much. When you have electricity, that changes fundamentally how we can operate as, as a society, which led to computers and all sorts of other technology attached to that. His opinion was that um, AI is, is likely going to be that same level of impact, meaning that it's gonna have a societal-wide impact in terms of what this uh, might do here, right? So it's interesting. My advice to you all as you think about AI is to embrace it. Now, is it going to be an immediate impact? Some fields, absolutely yes. If your job is heavily dependent on writing and analyzing lots of data and uh, recalling lots of data, especially text-based information, um, it's going to have an absolutely significant impact. I mean, I'm a I'm a professor at university, and I I, I will tell you at the college level, we are seeing mass uh, disruptions because of this technology. So it's going to happen. My advice to you all is to learn about it. To understand it and find ways to start embracing how that's going to happen on our on our facilities. Now, this is a a last minute uh, thing that we're kind of working on. I add this these slides here at the last minute here because we're actually doing um, on our own team with uh, another one of my students, uh, Neka Ubi, is that we're doing a study right now on facility managers and their perspectives about artificial intelligence. So we asked them their views about AI as potential applications and future trends here, and just a a, a Precursor, we haven't actually published the report yet. So this is literally um, hot off the press as the phrase worked. 70% of the FMs, almost 300 FMs we talked with this, are somewhat aware of what, what it is, right? The reasons why they started using AI is to manage data more efficiently, uh, manage their facilities more efficiently. And also like we talked about some of that workplace management. Challenges here is that 
primarily is the implementation, which is, is expected, right? If you have an antiquated system and now you're trying to implement you know, AI with that, that's a very time consuming effort. So when I talked about earlier, and I know that you know Dean uh, kind of alluded to that, um, AI won't take our job. But what this means here is that there is going to be a need in the future for people that can help organizations transition to a AI focused environment. Right. That's an example of a new type of job that currently really does not exist, but in the future is something that, that we'll hear. Now, in terms of these respondents, um, again, we're still going through the data. Um, we're trying to understand what this means, but about 50% of the people we talk with are currently not using AI in their facility operations. About another 20% currently are. And the report that we're working on is going to have specific examples or case studies of how people are using uh, this information. So a bit of a side gap here, but when you think about these future technologies and these future trends in FM, um, this is one of the major things that is coming with regards to AI. Now, when we think about AI and cybersecurity and other technologies, that's certainly a key point we have to think about that. So Juliana, why don't you walk us through cybersecurity and what we need to be aware uh, from that standpoint? Okay, so cybersecurity, as we all can see the picture on the slide, <laughs> is simply, connotes to us what cybersecurity is, securing our facilities that are, are enabled with smart technologies from getting attacked, misused. And then we all know that buildings get attacked more quickly when they have weak password protections for their systems, when your building maintenance is provided by third parties, and unfortunately for older buildings, they get attacked easily. So we're gonna take a brief look at real life scenarios of cyber attacks on some of our smart buildings. The first one being the Google WAF 7 building. So ethical hackers were able to assess a building control system, controlling the HVAC for Google's Australia headquarters in 2013. So you would all ask, how could these hackers hack into a company as tech savvy as Google? <laughs> a couple of things happen, and then these things can happen to facilities you and I manage if the necessary precautions are not taken. So we'll take a look at some of the things that happened. Their building automation system, which controlled the HVAC, was exposed on the public IP. Well, to the FM, what does that even mean? This means that the building automation system was directly connected to a web rather than being hidden behind a firewall. So the hackers used this opportunity to assess the system to find the administrative passwords for the control panels. This is really interesting. So they were armed with these administrative passwords and they were able to get into several other buildings Google was managing in Australia because the FM managing these buildings used the same username and password for all the other systems. And it caused very dire consequences for Google in 2013. The second one being the X-Force penetration test. This was just a test that IBM X-Force did in 2016 for a company that operates over 20 buildings across the United States. So the IBM group systematically probed their system. And then they also identified that their BA system, BAS system was also on the web, just like the Google case. And then they were able to assess their passwords, but luckily it was a test. Imagine that it was a real hacker, means that he would have gotten access to 20 buildings that were being managed by the FM. The next real scenario case is a casino smart thermometer. So this case happened in 2018 in a casino where the smart thermometer was attached to the lobby's fish tank of, of a casino. So these hackers manipulated the system and the vulnerability of the tank or of the smart thermometer being internet connected. So they stole all the data from the casino. And then the data they collected are high roller data from gamblers. I'm, I'm sure most, maybe some of us don't know what that is, but a high roller gambler is a gambler who constantly stakes large amounts of money. So the hackers wanted that data on those people and they, they did what they had to do on those names they identified. Finally, high-rise buildings. So a hacker targeted a commercial high-rise building between 40 to 50 floors. And then these, these, this building had about two government offices on them. And then the hacker penetrated into the parking system printer 
van exposed wireless access point. And it was telling the printer to print the message stating there's a bomb in the building. So imagine you're parking your car and you get a parking ticket after you finish paying and you or before you enter and you see that there's a bomb in this building. Chaos and mayhem just, you know, that place was just chaotic. And these are some of the practical reasons and things that we as facility managers can relate to. Cyber attacks are not far from our facilities at all. So what, 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 what as a team did we look at? We looked at data by looking at 27% of FM in 2021 alone who have experienced cyber attacks. And this is really alarming. Why, why, why did this happen? Because 38% of these FMs, professionals, they lack the skill in formulating the systems. So we spoke to our, our expert, Ms. Stacy, and she expressed that FMs like you and I should make cybersecurity a necessity rather than an option. So we all need to be abreast with time on our equipment and then make sure that we are cybersecurity savvy. If, if that cannot work out, we can also have a systematic approach where we FMs, the technology providers and the cybersecurity experts, we implement, implement a lot of mitigation efforts to secure the assets we manage. Absolutely, Juliana. And it kind of makes me think, I appreciate that Dean dropping in the chat box here that if there's a cybersecurity report has a lot of good details about what that includes. So be sure to check that out um, and, and get access to that, right? Because I think, Juliana, one of the main things here that we're advocating for is that, you know, as facility professionals, we have a lot of different areas that we need to be aware of, right? There's the operations of our facilities, there's the technical and you know, maintenance details, there's workforce aspect of it. And there's also a cybersecurity component of that, right? I don't think we're necessarily advocating for to be, uh, you know, high level technical IT experts with regards to security. But I think the main takeaway from this, right, is that we need to be aware and cognizant of what these uh, major challenges are from a cybersecurity standpoint. So again, be sure to check out IFLA's cybersecurity report on that and uh, to go th uh, from there. You know, one of the other major uh, areas that we're focused on here too, uh, in terms of these, these future trends and technologies is computerized maintenance management systems. Now, listen folks, he has, these have been around for a long time, right? This is not something new here, but um, the reason why we talked about this is because our ability to access data and what we can do uh, with regards to that data and, and various information here, right? So one thing here that this is an example, we worked with a city and they gave us all their CMMS data from different types of buildings and, and different data they have with that is using visual analytics to look at various FM tasks to understand what's actually happening in types of these different uh, facilities here, right? So in this particular organization, they went through the data and they can prioritize different outcomes of their assets within that, that system, which is produced by the CMS to look at uh, what's actually happening uh, with that here, right? So when you think about visual analytics here, what we're able to do with the, the raw data, which again, I'd advocate that most of you that have a CMMS or other related type of system that provides data, you can take that and understand what's going to happen. So when you think about global future trends, I think this is a major uh, push here, right? So for example, like we mentioned earlier, we, we now have benchmarks, first time ever for Africa, for the Middle East, for Asia, and we're looking at other regions throughout the world here, right? So there's definitely an interest in having this data here. And then as a facility professional going through that, and doing something with it, right? So we took all that data and we plotted on a chart here. And what we're gonna be able to do here is we looked at different types of assets and the associated labor cost to know what's going on to maintain these different assets. So again, there's a lot more detail here, but the, the focus here is that if you can plot uh, labor cost data and look at different types of systems, now you can start to understand where are major challenges or efforts coming from, right? The last thing as to why I think this is an important issue is that if you, we, we had the IFMA North America report that we just published um, about a year ago. And we asked respondents, what percentage of you are using these different types of systems to manage your, uh, your maintenance tracking, right? Out of the respondents, which is close to 2,000 people, 30% of them are using CMMS. But here's what's also interesting. 37%, the number one category of these types of people are using Excel and hard copies to track their data, right? So when you think about this here and why this is so important is that, 
Um, in fact, it's uh, Dean's comment here, going, going back to Dean here, data is the new currency and data analytics is how you unlock that value. So our advocacy here, the reason why we're talking about this, SEMA mass is not new, but the data behind it and what we can do with that is really where this comes uh, to, to fruition here, right? So when you think about data analytics and what we can do with that, right? We have data, we have information, but using those analytical tools allows us to understand what's happening. But most importantly, is that when you start applying data analytics to the information we have in the future, we can now do something with it. This is actionable knowledge that can do something with here and it'll clearly communicate as to what's happening, right? So one, one fun example of this here, the power of visual analytics to understand what's going on is let's go through this example here, right? So on top here, ask yourself all these numbers, how many six sixes do you see? So you can sit here and look at one, two, three, five, eight, six, nine, eight, set six, right? But if you start highlighting the data down here, in fact, my formatting got messed up here, folks, but there's a six here, six here, six here, six here. When you visually look at your data and present it in a way that people can understand it, you can do more uh, with that here. Now, I wanted to take a, a brief pause here and show some of the tools here that it was developed that can help us visually understand uh, what's going on in our, our organization. So I'm gonna pause my share here for a moment and we're gonna bring up a, a couple of tools that IFMA has available to make this um, easier from uh, this standpoint here. So let me bring up my slides. We're going to go through a couple examples of how we can actually take some of this data, right? So one of the tools that IFMA has available is called the uh, Resource Advantage Platform. And what this does here, that if you've read through any of IFMA's benchmark reports, is that sometimes we'd like to be able to take the reports and customize uh, what those look like. So what I can do here is I can go to this website. Uh, you can describe you know, what region you're in. So I can click on this, say, now this is just US focused, uh, North America. Um, we are expanding it to include Asia, uh, the Middle East and other regions. So that, that will be added in the future. You can click on which region your facility, you can describe the size of the facility, what type of facility this is, and the age of the facility. You go down here and you can you know, get access reports. You click on the button, put in your information, and this will generate a customized report that represents uh, what type of data that you're interested in, right? So once you click on that then, uh, what this shows you here, I'll bring this up here to show you what actually pops up once you do that, is that it brings up this type of window, which has all the data that you were interested in. So you click go here, this generates a PDF file that in this case here is for maintenance, has all the criteria we used here, and it goes through and summarizes all the data that's specific to the type of information that you're interested in. So we have maintenance cost, kind of zoom in here a little bit, right? It shows the average cost for all sorts of different systems here. But the thing with this is, is that's customized based on the type of data that you provided to us, right? So that, that's one example of how you can take data and do something with that, right? Now I wanna go through one more example, then we'll get back to the presentation here, is what if we were to have lots of data, like all of the benchmarking data that IFMA has available and be able to ask questions about that data? So in this example here, I'm going to go back to our website. IFMA has created a Tableau-based, we we'll call power user service, where folks can come in and be able to access information. So for example here, what this shows is maintenance cost per rentable square foot by different types of facility uses here. Now what this tool can do is I can select different criteria based on what I'm interested in here. Now in this case here, I have like US state. Again, this will be enhanced in the future here, but I have different states here that I can go and I can uncheck different information and this data live updates for what we're looking at here. So this one here is exterior maintenance cost. This is interior maintenance cost, deferred maintenance cost, and the total maintenance cost. I put in state over here, but you can do any sort of demographic feature that you're interested in. So you can do by size. You can do by location. You can do it by age of facility. You can do it by, you know, do they have a central plant or not? And whatever criteria you use here, this data will live update. Another example of this here is looking at staffing information, right? So we can look at different types of facilities based on where they're located and the average number of FTE carpenters, maintenance controls, generalists, supervisors, and so forth here, right? And again, I can adjust my criteria, my demographic data, and this will live update based on whatever criteria I'm picking here, and this data will transition to, to represent that, right? 
And we also have janitorial. You can do this by janitorial. So we have average janitorial cost. I had this by sector this time. So industry sectors, I can go over here. I can uncheck various things here that maybe I'm not interested in. And this data will live update based on what those criteria are. So, and again, I've only showed you a couple examples of what this is, but the intent of this here is that if you have data or you're looking for a good benchmark, if it has resources available to make this experience better and more efficient from how do you manage that data and, and power through and really understanding what's happening here, right? Now, again, uh, the main thing here as, as folks are talking to, uh, like Francisco and both Dean talk about here, is that we have to understand who controls that data and the accuracy and the completeness of what that data is here, right? This is a key part of what we need to look at to make sure that this is actually um, a meaningful experience for us uh, about this, right? Now, some of the, the, the other tools that we're also looking at here um, is the, 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 the value of building information technology. And again, this is not a new tool, right? When you think about future trends and more, more utilization of this, um, it, it's certainly a key thing that we're interested in with this, right? So when you think about BIM, um, again, this is not a new technology, but its adoption and its future use, I think is also important, right? From a facilities manager standpoint, a lot of our buildings here are existing buildings. In fact, the average age of buildings in the United States and facilities is uh, 50 years. In Asia, the average age is 15 to 20 years. So the reason why this is relevant for us is that if you're maintaining a decades old building that was not built under a BIM model, it's really challenging to digitize that and then incorporate that into a, a BIM model. You can certainly do that. There's certainly technology that, and people that do those services, but most of us, it's hard to get access to that information. But what we did here uh, was we looked at another study that looks at the impact of BIM on a facility operations, right? So in this particular example, um, we looked at, uh, in fact, our team, uh, Kristen uh, Barlish or Kristen Hurtado and Ken Sullivan, we are, and if we were, are part of our team here, we looked at where the real benefits of BIM and where the impacts of that, right? So when we think about how do you measure BIM and is it worth it for you, a couple of key metrics that we're interested in, right? The design cost, right? A, you know, architecture and engineering cost. 3D modern cost to actually take a, a physically built environment and model that or to take a physical set of plans and create a 3D model from those plans, contractor cost, and then the overall savings with BIM and design and construction and eventually uh, facilities management, right? So for this particular study, what we found here is that uh, the, the first case that we looked at here is looking at the impacts of BIM on RFIs, a request for information, change orders, and schedule impact. And in this particular case study, uh, we looked at non-BIM projects. So we saw change orders were at 12%, schedule delays at 15%, and for BIM projects, 7% and 5%, right? So there's certainly a positive impact from using BIM in this particular example. Now, again, folks, let us I don't want to oversell this here, right? This is a limited use case study of what this data represents. But what it does represent is that if you have a coordinated model and you're looking to renovate a facility, and everybody's looking at the same information, we have a better perspective about what that is going to look like, uh, that data can be really beneficial for us as to how we, we look at that. At the same time though, another part of this research study that we did here is to look at you know, some of the more soft skills or impacts on the projects, right? So we looked at you know, contractor accountability, verification of outcomes, and we looked at uh, you know, does, in, does BIM increase or decrease contractor um, accountability? Based on our survey respondents, 38% said it increased contractor accountability, 62% said that it actually decreased contractor uh, accountability, right? Verification, software costs about 50-50 you know, and learning curve, right? So my, my point of all this here is that BIM is a technology, it is out there, people are using it, and for facility management, this will likely be something in the future that more FMs are able to get access to. That as we have newer buildings come online, Many of those will likely have a BIM component potentially, but when we use that and how we look at that, that can certainly be a positive outcome. The last thing I'll talk about BIM is how do we measure or evaluate whether or not it's worth it to us as a facility manager. So in our study, we looked at change orders. That's one good measure you can look at. Avoidance issues, like how many times do we see issues come up on projects? So this is one thing you can track in terms of, you know, does BIM make a difference? and a number of other uh, different things as well. So again, if you want to copy these slides, we'll provide all this to you 
But again, these are, are key things to you to think about here. So uh, the new, um, the next kind of thing I want to talk about here is uh, higher bid work models. Uh, this is a, another major trend that we're seeing. Obviously, COVID has had an impact on that. And with that said, uh, Juliana, why don't you walk us through hybrid work models? Yes, Professor. Thank you for mentioning COVID. And I guess we all know what happened in 2020 where COVID hit and then most people were unsure how facility managers especially can manage their buildings. And one of the challenges that they faced was how to quickly implement the remote and hybrid work models. And I'm sure lots of us were <laughs> experiencing this. So we'll look at some data that we, um, as research team, implemented before COVID or noticed before COVID, that some of the buildings that we had, like for education, the average unoccupied space per square feet, feet were about 48,062. And then for the utilized space for education was about 91%. So we considered some of these flexible workspaces in relation to FM and how these workspaces can be, can, can, how the FM can understand the rules based on these workspaces, how maintenance and cleaning standards can also be implemented for FMs in these workspaces and how different things have happened after COVID. Now let's look at the hybrid work adoption model. And then we'll be looking at some facts here. So some real estate executives were, were interviewed and 83% of them had said they had fully adopted the hybrid work models. Why? Because 72% of their employees prefer the hybrid work models. And this is quite interesting. And this, this survey was done in 2021. So we'll take a look at some of the tools that can enable FMs implement hybrid work models environment. We'll look at the building management system, the real-time occupancy management system, and the integrated workplace management system. So what is a building management system? It's a system that monitors the mechanical and electrical equipment of buildings. And some of the examples that relate to FMs in using the building management system whilst working in a hybrid work model is the integration of these BMS with sensors that allow FMs to monitor indoor air quality from the comfort of your homes. So once these sensors are integrated with your BMS, you can literally see and monitor how your buildings have indoor air quality. So these BMS can also be enabled with IOTs that help FMs gather real-time data. So like I said earlier, IOTs help to gather and collect data and data is really important to FMs. So once you are able to uh, have, once you are able to gather this real-time data, you can adjust your building controls to align with the shifts of the building occupancy use. And the next one is the integrated workplace management system. This is a comprehensive tool for managing all your facility related tax and proper properties efficiently in one place. So how, how does this help the FM to work in a hybrid mode? It ensures that if you have any cleaning schedules, maintenance schedules, any information you want employees to know about whilst you are home, you can share this information via mobile phones and electronic devices to ensure that communication continuous whilst you are working hybridly. With all this information being in this one place, you can everybody can assess issues and resolve them faster. No information is hidden. The next one being the real-time occupancy management system. So looking at the slide, we have a picture where there's a motion sensor in a cubicle that detects if there's an employee in that space or not. So this real-time occupancy management system, it gives the FM real-time occupancy situations so that the FM can make informed decisions. So for instance, if this motion sensor detects that that cubicle is idle or there's no employee there, he can alert employees who want to use that office or who are intending to be in that office at, the, at a particular time. So these occupancy management system also help to detect if your space is being overcrowded 
or if there's a risk of it being overcrowded using IoT enabled sensors, giving you real time data. So some of the benefits of this hybrid work models are the fact that it helps that you provide sociability and structure to those who come into the office at the same time provided independence for those who work remotely, which is really interesting. You don't always have to be on site to manage your facility. It also decreases the amount of space needed and thereby decreasing cost of space use. For instance, if you have about 1,000 employees, we all know that all the 1,000 people will not be in the office at a time. So you can get a smaller space and manage the space adequately to reduce cost. The fewer the employees in the building, each day, the flexibility in terms of how the space is used and managed by the FM, like I mentioned earlier. Also, hybrid work models help to reduce energy. Like we saw with the motion detectors, if it detects that an, an idle space is not in use, it would, it would ensure that most of the lightning systems and all the systems that are being used in the building are either put off so that energy will be saved. But these, there are challenges that come with using these hybrid work models as an FM. It, these challenges are not to def, deter you from, you know, choosing the hybrid work models, but to help you mitigate them as they come. No single hybrid work model fits any all organizational needs. That is to say that it may differ. If your company has a lot of employees, the hybrid work model might not work for people who have fewer employees. The roles in the organization, the organizational culture. So you, as an organization, you need to assess your unique dynamics and develop a model that meets the needs of your company. And then when people work in hybrid, hybrid work models, though it helps to save energy, it helps to also fluctuate the energy use, unfortunately. So as an FM, you need to identify those fluctuating rates and then ensure that you implement efficiency means to you know, control and put a balance of the energy use in the building. Fantastic. And Julian, I just want to jump in here just for a second. Um, right. You know, we're, we're actually working on a new study that will be coming out here soon about the FM's experience in terms of managing um, that return to office uh, uh, function, right? Uh, the, the debate as to whether or not we should be in office or not in office is still ongoing here, but we're working on a new study that's looking to better understand uh, the best way to, to get that done from a facility standpoint. So I don't I don't think we necessarily have an opinion as to whether in office or remote is, is a better experience, but what we do have an opinion on is the best way to do that from a facilities management standpoint. How do we actually bring people back if that's the direction from your organization? So be, be on the lookout for that. And that kind of leads us to our last point, right, Juliana, is sustain sustainability yeah. and some of the main things that we need to think about uh, from that standpoint. Juliana, go ahead. Yeah, so sustainability, quite a hot topic in FM now. And simply put, making your building safe for the environment. So we spoke to Dean, our sustainability expert, and he thinks or he says that sustainability to facility managers is ensuring that we can track and measure and reduce carbon emissions of our building. So we as um, a team, a research team, try to understand what decarbonization is from Dean's standpoint. And then we also, we also identified that it is to reduce carbon dioxide emissions using lower carbon power sources. And like Dean mentioned, tracking the energy use of your building. And then also we found out that you can use less energy to maintain the same building occupancy comfort. That is doing more with less of the same. And then some of these sustainability measures that have been you know, investigated through literature is by using energy efficient HVAC systems and then using building materials that are sustainable, recycling, and then having to use or install lithium ion batteries. It's something interesting to know that buildings are responsible for 19% of all the energy used in the world. And then Dean also asserted that about 37% of our commercial real estate buildings contribute to carbon emissions globally. So this is really important to note that we need to have sustainability in mind as FMs in managing our facilities. 
So we can look at some of the areas um, that we can do as FMs in maintaining sustainable practices. We all recycle waste in our buildings. So all the recycled waste, we can actually try and I mean, all the separated waste, we can actually try and recycle them. And like I mentioned earlier, we can use motion sensors on some of our buildings that help to control humidity and thermal conditions of the buildings. Also, we should migrate from paper use, you know, and try and use more data online or on cloud basis. And as we have been mentioned for all this period, upgrading our HVAC system because they produce a lot of carbon emissions. And the interesting thing coming up right now is the fact that facility managers are also being um, incorporated or included in the design phase of construction. So to say that we have the ideas about how the buildings can be sustained in 10 years and 100 years. So once we are we are put into the design phase, we can tell the contractors or the clients or the owners that, okay, these are some of the materials that can help our buildings 100 years. So it's a very good step for us to take. Absolutely. You know, it's really interesting, Juliana. We, we kind of mentioned decarbonization. And I know at least uh, there's certain locations I know in Europe has, has been a major push. There's some states now here in the US, they're also looking at decarbonization. And there's a lot of different perspectives on it, right? On the one hand, uh, there's a need to be mindful and good stewards of what we have from a, a restore standpoint. But on the other hand, is that the initial investment to make these uh, decarbonization goals feasible, I mean, there's, there's major cost implications from a facilities management standpoint that we have to be aware of. So um, it's, it's definitely not resolved as to what that's going to look like in the future. We're actually working on a study right now um, to, we're actually interviewing FMs right now to look at how decarbonization policy is affecting their organizations, how they're kind of re preparing for that and what are some of the lessons learned. So I, I'll put that out there that if if you yourself have personal firsthand experience in responding to decarbonization regulations or policies, um, we'd really like to talk to you. So be sure to, to connect with me on LinkedIn or send me an email because uh, we're, we're definitely interested in chatting about that. So the last major part of our report here is looking at facility management in healthcare. Now, I know this is a very specific field. In fact, many of you may not work in this space here, but the reason why we're talking about this and why this is such a big deal is that if you look at the workforce demographics and what's happening globally across the world is that there's going to be an increased need for healthcare systems, healthcare facility managers, and that's why we're, we're talking about this. Now, some of the major trends that we're looking at in healthcare, uh, specific to FM, is the use of technology as to what is going on uh, with that, right? So there's different technologies that are available to make that easier. There's also sanitation considerations, air quality, of course, sustainability is another part uh, of that as well. So the actual technical side of how do we maintain our facilities, especially for those that work in that space, is changing. But more importantly, I think a bigger impact here is that there's a need for people that can work in those spaces. So as the population ages and there's more people that need healthcare facilities, well, therefore there's a need to increase the number of facility professionals who can work inside of that space. So one thing I just wanted to show here briefly here is the demographic trends by age. Now this is uh, focused on the United States just because that's what I have access to, but we also looked at um, Latin America, uh, Mexico, Canada, and Europe, and broadly speaking, these trends here that we're seeing is really interesting. So what this chart here shows is that these green lines, these green bars is from 2019, the last time a census done was done here in the US, and 2010, I had 10 years before that. And when you look at this here, and why hopefully this hits home, why we're so focused on healthcare FM, is that as you look at this chart, there's a shift upwards when you look at all this data, that if you plot this together and look at how these are changing, is that the average age here is, is going up. In fact, the US population has on average aged about three and a half years since the year 2000, right? The, the entire population globally is getting older, right? There's, there's pockets where that's not applicable, but generally speaking, that's what's going on here. Well, the reason why this is so relevant here is that from a, a um, a facility standpoint, 
and finding people that primarily provide those services is that this age demographic right here. This is men, uh, this is women on the right-hand side here. And if you look at this gap here, like you see this difference right here, this little tiny circle I'm drawing, this is the difference compared to 2010 compared to 2019. Well, the reason why it's so relevant to us is that that age group, that group of people is leaving the workforce, right? They're, they're aged out, they've gone, done other things here. And so this is a major issue in consideration that, that we're worried about as we go forward here. So when you think about uh, the retirement wave for healthcare FMs, here's what we found. We, we did a research study of this, myself and uh, another colleague, uh, Dr. Steve Call, 60% of healthcare facility managers are planning to retire by 2028. 60% of the FMs in healthcare are retiring by 2028. So what you have here is you have a decrease in the number of FMs that are working in this space and an increase in the number of spaces needed for those facilities because people are getting older. So that's, <laughs> this is why we're talking about this folks. This is a huge issue that from a workforce standpoint as to how we need to think about that, right? So there's other parts of the report we looked at. Uh, the main thing here that we looked at is how do we fix these issues and what's coming down the line here is that supporting a healthcare facility engineering workforce is something crucial that needs to happen. There's recruitment plans from a, a maintenance technician standpoint, from a manager standpoint, and these are certainly critical things that from a global trend standpoint is what is going to be happening. Again, I know it's a pretty specific area, but it's something that we need to be aware of as we go forward and, and, and as we think about this here, right? So in summary here are some of the, the main points uh, that we need to be interested in. The key learning points here is that we are in a changing world, right? Uh, things are coming down. AI is a certainly a hot topic. Uh, you need to read about this. The report is just about done. We'll be sending out that here soon. But again, we need to understand and leverage the skill sets of the people that we have available. Last thing here is that I think there's some major, major headwinds from a workforce standpoint and from a technology standpoint from, from FMs. But in spite of all this, my opinion is that the future is bright. We, we may have to go through a rough patch here for, for a few years, but I think the overall future is looking very bright, especially the more people that we can get engaged and participate on, on this uh, experience here. So in fact, uh, I think uh, Dean Stanberry will kind of close out with his quote here is that we need to attract more people to make FM a career choice. And we need to leverage technology to augment the lower workforce levels. I 100% completely agree with that. That's what we have to do here. And the way we do that is by start embracing the technology. Get on board here because it's coming. And so we need to be ready here. Folks, we have a, a few minutes for questions or comments. So if you do have anything, be sure to type it out here. If you'd like a copy of the slides, uh, pull up your phone, snap a photo of my email address here. Be glad to send that to you. Uh, but otherwise, um, we'll take a few questions. But otherwise, I think that's maybe all we got here. So I'll give folks just another minute here. If you want to type any final questions, be sure to do that. So one question I do see here is uh, from Jesse Porter. Do you see this trend expanding to other sectors as well? I think Jesse is referring to the fact that uh, there's changes in the workforce. I think this is what we're talking about here. And the answer is, is yes to some degree. So for example, at our institution, there's a computer engineering program that the enrollment levels have completely taken off. Now, as to whether or not that's gonna be sustained, I don't know. Uh, I think there's headwinds for sure, but um, other sectors, we're, we're definitely seeing these, these older demographics, right? Construction, facilities management, it's still aging. And that's why there's such a need here to bring in new people to the workforce to attract and, and make sure that folks are, are really, um, uh, this before. And again, it's like Dean and I got together ahead of time. So Dean, give me really good quotes here because we got another <laughs> another good quote from Dean here is that at them, uh, and not just at them, but broadly speaking, that we have never experienced this rapid of a change before, like the, the introduction of AI. So, I mean, this is, is absolutely significant as to what's going to happen and what um, that that's going to be looking like uh, in the future here. So, folks, that brings us to the end of our presentation here today. We uh, really, really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you to Juliana for doing uh, such an all-star job to get this together. We appreciate her insights. We appreciate you all being here today. With that said, take care of yourselves. And until next time, take care, everybody. Bye.